public can also live stream the meeting on our website and our YouTube channel. As always, the meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Thank you. Oh, and our technician this evening is Cedric. Thank you, Mayor Story. Yeah, thank you, Chloe, and thank you, Cedric, uh, for handling uh, tech uh, this evening. Um, before I um, call, uh, do the roll call, I did want to acknowledge it seems that we have a new council member this evening, uh, Council Member Brown. Um, so I just wanted to congratulate her um, on her um, uh, ascendancy to uh, the capital of the city council um, and, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and other aspects of life. So congratulations. Um, Thank you. I'll have to get used to calling you council member Brown. Uh, so with that, um, let's have a roll call. Yes. Council member Bertrand. I'm here. Council member Brooks. Here. Council member Brown. Here. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Here. Mayor Story. Here. Uh, next, we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance, and um, I'm going to ask uh, Council member Brown if she'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, next call, um, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda this evening? Staff has no changes to my agenda. Okay, and I, the next item, I see that we have one presentation tonight, the introduction of the Capitola City Manager Department staff member, Lois Austin Lee. I hope I said that correct, my apologies. Uh, um, and the Recreation Division staff member, Jesse Leva. Um, do we have a presentation? Yes, um, Mayor Story, I'll introduce um, our new Deputy City Clerk. Uh, Louis comes to us with lots of relevant um, experience, most recently working for the City of San Jose in their Clerk's Department. He's been our Deputy City Clerk since December last year, and we're all just thrilled to have him. And I believe he's here to just say a couple, a couple words. And I think some of you on Council have met him in the office, so we wanted to formally introduce him this evening. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome, Lewis. We have the... Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Uh, thanks, Lori, for that introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be introduced to you today formally. I have met some of you uh, previously, but not everybody. Um, I've been working with the city now for the last uh, several months, like Lori said. Um, and I like the opportunity to work so when I saw the job posting, I knew I had it. Uh, uh, when I read it, the, the job posting, the job description, I knew I, I, I was confident I had the skills, the attitude, the qualities, and the uh, qualification needed to excel in the role. And I needed to get some kind of uh, uh, life and work balance. And there's been a tremendous opportunity to work in this environment. And then uh, I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, Council for, for having me around, and I look forward to working with all of you. Yeah, thank you, Lewis, and, and welcome uh, to, to Capitola and, uh, and becoming a member of the Capitola City staff. Um, and we look forward to working with you um, and seeing you around City Hall. Uh, yeah. So we have uh, another staff member uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, good evening, Mayor Story Council members. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Jesse Leva, uh, who is a native of Modesto, California, and holds degrees from CSU Stanislaw, San Jose University, and Arizona State University. He received his commission as an officer in the United States Air Force and was stationed part time at Moffett Hill Airport Airfield. Jesse has served as a music conductor.
conductor and teacher at public school as well as higher education. And additionally, he has served the city of Santa Cruz as the mail carrier. Jesse currently lives in Santa Cruz with his wife, Lori, and their dog, Diego. Uh, we, as well as he, is excited that he has joined the Capitola staff as our new recreation coordinator that will oversee our classes, program, promotions, as well as the community center and um, hopes to enrich the lives of our community. And so I am pleased to introduce Jesse Leva to the council. Yeah, welcome, Jesse. Did you want to say a few words, Jesse? Yes, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, um, council members and Nikki, for the introduction. Um, I moved to the area about a year and a half ago, and um, when I saw this job posting, I really was excited about it to get a chance to really become a part of the community and serve the community in Capitola. Um, my wife and I go to church every Sunday in Naptos and then head down to Capitola to spend our Sunday afternoons out there, whether it's dining in the area or, or take, recently taking surfing lessons. That's what we've gotten into as well. So. Uh, we're just really excited to become a part of the community and, and serve the community of Capitola. So I'm just really excited about being a part of the team that Nikki's put together. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, Jesse. Um, and um, welcome uh, to Capitola and uh, being a member of the Capitola City staff. Uh, it sounds like you have um, a broad range of skills and experiences. And so um, I think um, you know we're lucky to have you, both you and Lewis as a part of our team. Um, and Jesse, I also want to thank you for your service. Um, and um, we look forward to uh, working with you and seeing you around City Hall. We'll, we'll all get there someday soon. So, <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Nikki. Um, next, we'll have um, a report on a closed session from our city attorney. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. We have a closed session on the item on the agenda and no reportable action was taken. Thank you. Uh, Chloe, do we have any additional material? We did not receive any for this meeting. Thank you. Um, the next part of our agenda is oral communications. This is uh, an opportunity for members of the public to address the council on items that are not on tonight's agenda. Um, and uh, if you would like to speak, you can raise your hand on Zoom um, or dial star nine if you want to phone in. Uh, our moderator will unmute you and you'll have three minutes to speak. Uh, you can also send an email to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. And emails will be read for us in three minutes. Larry, do we have IC1 hand up? Yes, Mayor Story, we have Linda Smith. Yes. Um, hi, Linda. Hi, Sam. Um, I have apparently had too much coffee, so if I sound a little breathless, I apologize. Uh, but I want to thank you, Mayor, Mayor Story, City Council members, and City Manager for allowing me to comment on an item not on tonight's agenda, which is outdoor dining in Capitola Village. Staff indicated that an update and opportunity to extend our existing program will come before you on the April 28th agenda, and I look forward to that being a reality and hope to see an extension granted at least through the end of the summer. But what I'm here tonight to request is that in light of the prototype design schedule slip, I'm requesting that council provide some additional guidance to the prototype design effort. I was unable to attend, but was able to watch the YouTube video of the April 7th Planning Commission meeting that reviewed the draft prototype design for the street dining deck, previously called Parklets in Capitola Village. I was encouraged by the amount of effort and attention paid by staff and its consultants in formulating a design that will complement the existing streetscape, assure consistency with the various venues, and be an easy and cost-effective implementation for the restaurant owners. Unfortunately, I was discouraged by the specificity of materials and design at the detail level that were presented. It seems that the prototype design is targeted to contain a list of specific tables, chairs, and even plants that applicants will have to select from most of a very modern style. Furnishings are part of a specific restaurant branding and image, and using the prototype design is significantly incentivized through the permitting requirements established in the ordinance. 
not using the prototype design may be cost and time prohibitive, so it needs to be right. Much effort seems to be being spent on the styling of furnishings and railings, while there are many sourcing and site-specific issues yet to be tackled. Although suggesting low-maintenance plants is helpful, I submit that the prototype design should not include a full menu of acceptable tables, chairs, string lights, and specific umbrellas. Heaters and other accessories for inclement weather were absent from the draft. These details will take time to address, and until a baseline is established for construction costs, which sites are actually going to participate cannot be confirmed. I ask that you encourage an approach that would identify dominant design elements that would set a high standard for the Capitola design, such as planters and decking, but allow existing and or applicant selected furnishings, tables and chairs, podiums and service stations, possibly even railings, heaters, umbrellas, and other accessories for inclement weather to be used without violating the prototype design for permit and installation purposes. A list of prohibited materials could also be included. This would minimize expenses for the restaurant and accelerate installation of beautiful street dining decks in the village. If it is your will that a menu of specific furnishings be included in the prototype design, I ask you to consider directing the prototype design team to include a phased implementation approach, allowing staff approval of off-list furnishings such as less modern designs without classifying the application as full custom and requiring planning commission review. As stated in December, conversion to the approved prototype design quickly is the goal. It's critical that the prototype design be acceptable and cost-effective to the applicant. Therefore, limiting the scope of the specificity, establishing a phased implementation approach within the, the definition of the prototype design, and communicating cost expectations to potential applicants will bring beautiful street dining decks to Capitol faster. Thank you for considering my comments. I know you can't discuss this tonight, but I really thank you for listening. I truly believe this issue is critical to the recovery of Capitola Village's economic vitality. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for your comments. Um, are there any other members of the public that wish to address the council this evening? There's no attendees, and I do not have any emails on the topic. Yeah. Okay, um, well then, uh, let's move on now to staff and city council comments. I'll ask first if staff has any comments, and then I'll get to you, John. We have one comment this evening from Director Hurley. Good evening, Mayor Swery and Council. Um, on the same subject, I wanted to update you on our outdoor dining ordinance. Um, we were hoping to be on the April um, agenda for the for the Coastal Commission, and due to two outstanding items with the Coastal Commission that we're trying to work through at the staff level, we did not make it on the April agenda. We're continuing to work with our staff and we'll bring you, be bringing you an update at your next meeting on April 28th. So we're, we'll have an update for you on April 28th and we're also monitoring the outdoor dining in the village to bring you more data on the usage and um, look forward to that conversation then. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, Josh, I think you had your hand. Oh, hey, before I move on, any other staff um, have comments? That does it for us this evening. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Uh, so I'll go ahead to Council Member Shock. Do you have your hand up first? I guess I did, and um, I just like to call out to uh, uh, planning. And um, I was working on an issue dealing with uh, a recent approval on Prospect, and I'd like to compliment planning and their um, response to uh, various issues there and engagement with uh, interested parties. And so i just like to point that out again. Uh, I think our staff and planning is doing a great job. And so when something comes up like this, I'd like to mention it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, Council Member Brooks. Thank you, thank you, Mayor Story. Um, I have a couple of things I just wanted to update Council and um, our community members about. I was just recently appointed as by the Mayor's 
coalition and by the um board members of lasco as their current vice chair um also i'm a member of the policy um the policy board for three c e and i wanted to let everyone know that they have a we have just announced several incentive programs for um for e-bikes and a few and for green green cars what are they called rechargeable cars there's a lot of um funding out there that our community members can um, submit for through 3CE. In addition, I'm a jurisdictional member for the Youth Action Network. This is the organization that our uh, city of Capitola uh, supports and is a part of. It's also known as YAN, and they are currently working or have just met with the police department on some concerns about our youthful, um, our youth uh, hanging out down in Capitola Village, and they're working in partnership with them on um, on creative ways of engaging youth in um, in being better community members. Um, also, I'm a member of the Children's Network, and we I am just been appointed as as a third chair, and we are working on an action awareness two-year strategic plan that we'll be presenting to the Board of Supervisors. And again, these are all jurisdictional appointments. And then lastly, um, our city manager didn't um, share out yet, but that staff has submitted another request for an earmark um, to Panetta, Jimmy Panetta, uh, Congressman Panetta, for funding for our work. And so um, fingers crossed that this year we might see funding coming in for that again. So. Um, if you are out or attending any events and you see him, um, most certainly say hello and encourage him to support our project at the Capitola Wharf. Thank you, Mayor Story. You're welcome. Thank you. And congratulations on being the vice chair of AMBAG and the chair of the Children's Network. Um, Not AMBAG, uh, LASCO. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. That's Councilmember Peterson. Thanks for that correction. And my apologies to Councilmember Peter or Brown. Um, so, um, seeing no other council members put their hands up, I'm going to move this on to the consent agenda. Um, the consent items will be handled with um, a single vote, unless the council member wishes to pull one for further discussion. Um, does the council member wish to pull a consent item, agenda item? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a motion by Council Member Brown? Is there a second? I can second that. Yeah, that's a, a second by Vice Mayor Tyser. Um, and I'll ask for a roll call vote. Council Member Bertrand. Mm -hmm. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to the general government public hearing uh, portion of our agenda. Um, and the first item is A, which is a report on the community grants program review. The recommended action is just to receive the report and to provide direction. Um, so, we have a staff report on this. Yes, good evening, Mayor Story, Council Members. Tonight um, on this item, we will be receiving a presentation on the second phase of the review of the Capitola Community Grants Program. Um, tonight, the presentation will be given by Nicole Young and Nicole and So I'd like to just allow them to move forward. Great. Thank you, Larry, and thank you, Mayor Story, and, and Council Members. Great to see everyone this evening. I'm going to share my screen so that you can see the whole thing, both slides. Um, and so, again, I'm Nicole Young of Optimal Solutions Consulting, and I'm joined this evening by my colleague, Nicole Bledson of Cole Communications. And we work collaboratively on a number of projects uh, for nonprofits and public agencies, including 
the current phase of Capitola's Community Grants Program, or CGP, review. So uh, tonight we'd like to share with you some of the work that we've been doing. Um, we were able to talk with several of you leading up to this evening's meeting, so hopefully some of this will sound familiar. Um, but we also have some recommendations to share with you and, and see what you think of those. So, um, we are, as Larry mentioned, basically continuing work that we started a couple of years ago now. So we're calling this phase two of the project uh, that really is building on the prior review and report for the city that we completed in 2020, basically right before the pandemic. Uh, and in that report, we had proposed an array of options for improving the community grant program. That were, again, we're based on a, a process where we interviewed several of you, um, looked at some uh, you know, data information about your current grantees, and then proposed um, some ideas about how to move forward. And at that time, the council had agreed to take incremental steps to improve the community grants program over the course of one to two years. And then COVID happened, uh, and everything got paused. So now here we are, we're ready to resume this work and want to provide you with some updated options for improving and adapting the community grant funding process. And so in this current phase, we have prepared what we call a Capitola Community Profile using city-level data from public sources. We reviewed and summarized some lessons and insights from a series of dialogues that we held with local and regional funders and community-based organizations. And that happened as part of the process of developing the core investment request proposals that the county and city of San Jose are in the midst of administering right now. And as many of you know, we interviewed almost all of you, the council members, to hear your reactions to the data in the community profile. We want to be able to understand how you thought about community grants and how that uh, funding contributes to health and well-being in Capitola and hear your current thinking about the ideal community grant process. So again, tonight we're going to share some insights from these activities as well as a draft set of guiding principles and recommendations that reflect the findings and feedback from both phase one and two of this project. We know that most of you reviewed the community profile that we prepared prior to our interviews with you. And if not, we hope that you've had a chance to review them more fully um, in the council meeting packet before today's meeting, since we won't have the time to review them in depth today. And the profile contains data that we were able to locate for the city of Capitola or the 95010 zip code. And then it's organized by the core conditions for health and well-being, which is a key element to me. <clears throat> of the collective of results and evidence-based or core investments framework. And the concept of the core conditions has provided some language that helps us build a shared understanding of what it takes to create equitable health and well-being for everyone in our county at all stages of life. And several local funders, service providers, collaboratives, and initiatives are aligning their priorities and work with the core conditions and that includes the county and city of Santa Cruz, as Nicole just mentioned, with the core RFP process, as well as first five Santa Cruz County strategic plan and several United Way initiatives. So in many ways, this concept of the core conditions for health and well-being can be useful for planning, for funding, for program development and evaluation. So from reviewing the profile, you'll know that it includes some demographic data and a handful of data for each of those eight core conditions that you saw on the previous slide. On the last page of the profile, data sources are provided in case you want to see where the data came from or explore further. We just want to acknowledge that the limitations of the community profile include the fact that not all the data that the counselor community may want to see are already available at the city or zip code level because some of the data are still only available countywide. And this is often the case with this type of data. Um, some of the data have a time lag. They might be a couple years or more old depending on how frequently they're collected um, by the original source for the data and how long it takes to clean and verify the data before it shows up on a source like DataShare, which we used extensively for this. 
So the data um, may not fully reflect the impacts of something recent like COVID at this time. But we thought the major patterns and trends that you can see in the profile still seem relevant for this purpose, and we hope they'll be meaningful to all of you as a conversation starter um, within the council and also perhaps form the basis for future updates as well. And although we don't have time to review specific data points today, we did want to share some of the comments um, and insights that we heard during the interviews with you um, so that you can react and hear, hear those. In general, the council members who were interviewed appreciated that the community profile was in place and, and being able to see the, the data organized in this way by the core conditions. And they felt it was helpful to see and know uh, data in terms of comparisons to other cities or jurisdictions and the countywide data as well. In some cases, the data affirmed what, what you all thought you knew, and in other cases, they filled in some gaps or, or raised new questions. So we heard comments such as, I didn't realize this before, for example, that 40% of older adults in Capitola uh, have a disability, and that rate is higher than the countywide percentage of 29%, or that the annual cost of infant and toddler care can sometimes exceed tuition at a UC campus. We also heard comments that the data were either lower than, than some of you might have expected, like the 34% of residents with a bachelor's degree or higher, which is the second lowest percentage in the county, or statistics about median household income, or the AARP livability score. And others, of course, were higher than expected, like the 28% of children and youth who live in families with incomes below the federal poverty level. That is the highest in the county. The council members' key takeaways from the profile are probably best summarized by the quote you see here. Those who want to live here can't. Those who can afford to live here don't. The profile data also affirms how many of these indicators are related to one another or interconnected like the core conditions. So for example, employment and economic security are tied to access, uh, affordability of child care, the stability and affordability of housing, physical and mental health, all of these can affect the ability to work, the feeling of connection to community, and vice versa. And you also told us about some data that you wish were available or would have liked to have seen in a profile, such as more information about adolescent and young adult age groups, especially whether they plan to stay in Capitola and what might make them want to stay, some civic engagement measures, um, particularly connection to local government, participation in volunteer activities, and some social capital measures that we think of as elements of community connectedness. There was also interest in um, data about access to counseling and mental health services, especially in the wake of the stresses of the last two years. And then data that we just didn't have a chance to compile for this profile, but might still be available in, in more detail, like the nature of service calls to the Capitola Police Department, or other data that are held by, uh, by city departments. Um, the effects of tourism on quality of life was another one that was mentioned, and the homeless census count, which actually will be available soon because a new report is uh, pending release. And not all of these data are available at all, and some are not available by city or zip code level, so they're less useful for this purpose. But um, we hope that along with the data from city departments, and um, this is the universe of available data changes quickly, so in the future, more of this may be available for a future profile or an update of, of what you've seen so far. Now I want to share some of the most salient and relevant lessons and insights that came out of the dialogue with funders and community-based organizations or CDOs when the county and city of Santa Cruz were planning this for a request for proposal. So Nicole and I facilitated those dialogues for the county and the city. And so during those discussions, we got to hear from other funders that some of them were also reevaluating their funding processes. 
they're looking for ways to streamline and simplify their applications and reporting requirements. So basically, you're not alone in this endeavor. Um, and it became clear through these dialogues that simple does not always mean easy. There can be difficult to operationalize simplicity, especially for government agencies that need to ensure they have a, a fair, clear, transparent process for allocating public funds. Whereas private funders like foundations often have more leeway to create their own rules and, and make changes. Um, we also heard that other funders are finding the core conditions to be a useful framework for organizing their thinking and their strategic priorities, even if they're not pooling their funds with the county and city of Santa Cruz. Uh, and we heard this kind of message as well as clear from both funders and CBOs to embed equity throughout the funding process from beginning to end. So basically, don't treat it as an optional add-on or an afterthought. Um, and then interestingly, uh, you know, we heard several of the CBOs talking about and acknowledging that they know that making funding decisions are hard. They don't, <laughs> they don't envy the positions that elected uh, or, or government staff are in. Um, and they recognize that not everyone can be happy with the decision. Um, but they, a lot of them mention things that are helpful or that they appreciate from funders. Um, things like clear and frequent communication about expectations and timelines, any changes that are anticipated. Uh, they appreciate when there are tools and technical assistance available that can help them understand what funders are asking for or expecting. And so uh, there are tools now available or for free or things that Nicole and I offer on an ongoing basis through Port Institute Defense. So there's already kind of a library or a base of some of those tools and technical assistance uh, that could be available for Capitola grants. Um, CBOs also talk about appreciating it when they're only asked for information that will actually be used for funding decisions and reports. So um, kind of the idea of don't ask me a bunch of extraneous <laughs> questions and information uh, just because you're not quite sure what you actually want. So um, you know just being really intentional and thoughtful about what is the information that you need, what are the questions you need to ask to uh, get that information to, to make your decisions. And then uh, the last point here, appreciation when the level of detail that's required in grant applications and expectations about reporting, reporting, requ reporting results are proportional to the amount of funds requested. So small grants, um, uh, you know, that don't come with like 20 pages for an application or a reporting requirement. So keep it in proportion to the amount of funds uh, being requested or granted. So that was, those are some of the themes and lessons from other funders and CBOs. Now moving on to some of the themes that emerged when we did our interviews with all of you, the council members. Again, we appreciate getting the chance to talk with you again. We had done interviews in phase one of the community programs with you, but again, felt like so much has happened and changed since then that it seems important to hear current perspectives. Uh, and we certainly heard a lot of valuable insights and suggestions that come around, and we've grouped them into five high-level themes. So the first one is data and results, and really using a situational approach when trying to figure out what's the appropriate level of data and results to expect. Um, we heard, as Nicole mentioned, all of you talked about um, you know, just being appreciative of the community profile, so having data helpful, being you know, organized by the core conditions, provided a useful framework for thinking about community strengths and needs and priorities. Some of you expressed interest in seeing updates periodically. And there was also a general desire from all of you to understand what results will be or have been achieved with community grant funding. And so that led to some good discussions about how much and what kind of data is reasonable to request in applications and reports without adding unnecessary burden for either the CBOs or for city staff. And then that in turn led to a related discussion about the, the idea of output versus outcomes. So output being kind of units of service, you know, number of services provided, number of people served, versus outcomes being those measurable changes or improvements as a result of the services provided. And here, you know, the general theme was that a nuanced or situational approach is best. Um, we heard often, you know, it depends on the situation. So for instance, small grants or certain types of services 
you know, measuring output, the number of services, number of people, seems appropriate uh, for a larger grant and or for programs that provide more complex services to address more complex issues. Outcomes actually are valuable because council members want to know whether community grants have contributed to some of those measurable improvements. The next theme is around high, setting high-level priorities, and I would say the kind of recurring theme here was um, using a data-informed approach and also alignment. So uh, there were some suggestions along the lines of you know align the community grant funding with the city's budget goals and priorities or other goals and priorities in other existing city plans and revenue streams like the CDBG funding where the state is actually the list the priorities uh, or things like the city's housing element plan or climate action plan. Basically the, the, the theme of the question was, you know, why create another set of priorities and goals and outcomes when we already have a number of plans and goals that could provide um, some guidance. A related theme is around leveraging opportunities. And so all of you that we were able to talk with uh, mentioned, you know, willingness to explore opportunities to leverage funding with other funding sources, with other initiatives, even if it meant Capitola wouldn't have full control over the funds or wouldn't know exactly how many Capitola residents benefited. Again, the common theme was it depends on the situation. Uh, but all of you mentioned examples of how Capitola is already doing this with things like the Opioid Settlement Fund, contributing to the Homeless Action Partnership, the countywide homelessness response, and talk about how you understood that Capitola's contributions uh, helped improve or helping to improve health and well-being of the community at large, which includes Capitola. Uh, and that may not always be possible to explain exactly how many Capitola residents benefited you know, given the dollars that you contributed. Some of you did mention um, that using community grants to do more of that kind of leveraging, you know, would require more, some more thorough planning and discussion with other funders, co-funders, because it does often involve sharing or even giving up a sense of control. So you want to make sure you have some, you know, good, solid agreements in place before you enter that kind of agreement. The last two things have to do with the process. So there were, um, number of comments about, you know, wanting to ensure a consistent, stable process for community grants, where the line item in the budget for community grants is seen as being as valuable and necessary as any other budget line item. So it's not a question that has to get revisited year after year of whether the community grants program is necessary or good use of city funds. Um, and it's not framed as a zero-sum choice, meaning, you know, it's a fund for community grants, it takes money away from something else. But instead, frame it as a question such as how can Capitola contribute to more equitable health and well-being for city residents through community grants as well as other resources, city resources. And lastly, there was recognition that agencies value community grant funding even if it's a small amount. Many nonprofits use together funding from multiple local, state, and federal sources. So Capitola's funding is an important piece of that puzzle. Uh, but we also heard from you as council members the general desire to balance support for existing grantees that provide services that will likely always be needed you know, because they address basic needs with opportunities for new applicants, new programs, new projects that are innovative. So the main message that we heard was, you know, we don't want to destabilize nonprofits, but we also don't want to maintain the status quo just for the sake of history. And in fact, some of you talked about the importance of reevaluating community grants you know, as the process and community needs and priorities periodically because changes in the process and funding decisions may actually be needed for the benefit of the community. So based on everything that you've heard, the community profile, the insights and useful lessons from other funders and community-based organizations, the themes from the council member interviews, uh, we compiled these suggestions for draft guiding principles to help you identify priorities and make decisions about community grant funding. These principles could offer some of the consistency that Nicole referred to just now across grant cycles while still leaving some room for change and flexibility. And they all reflect some type of balancing act. So balancing unmet needs with 
existing needs, aligning with some of the other plans and processes Nicole just described, while also being able to address emerging issues that we don't know yet, uh, focusing on Capitola residents, while also recognizing that those geographic boundaries are fluid for individuals and families, and all the other features that are implicit in being stewards of these funds, while also trying not to excessively burden grantees for uh, information requests or staff with um, reviewing and evaluating the information that you do collect from, from grantees. So here are our recommendations. We have five of them for you to consider, which are, again, based on all the findings and feedback from both phases of this review. So I'll briefly describe each one, and then we have a few examples of what that could look like. And then after our review, they will open up for any questions you have. So our first recommendation is to identify three or four priority areas of funds that are informed, and that selection is informed by data about overall needs and specific populations, much like the data in the community profile. And it's aligned with, again, city goals and commitments and organized by the core conditions for health and well-being. The next recommendation is to allocate an equal percentage of community grant funding across those three to four selected priorities. So for example, 25% to each priority area if you were to select four priorities. Uh, and we recommend doing that unless or until a more thorough prioritization process that has ample opportunities for community engagement can occur. And the next recommendation is to consider <clears throat> awarding multi-year grants that align with other local funding cycles. So the multi-year increases stability and predictability for the CBOs. Uh, it enhances, you know, by aligning with other local funding cycles, it enhances the potential for leveraging and collaborating with other funders. And overall, it just reduces the workload for both grantees and staff, doing it, you know, less on a uh, less frequent cycle. The next recommendation is uh, to consider using Guide Star profiles and the candid seals of transparency as your community grant application. So I'll explain it a bit more in a moment, but if you're not familiar with Guide Star, it's an online searchable nationwide directory of nonprofits that other funders and donors often use when they're looking for information on a nonprofit mission, their programs, their people, their leadership, and financial health. So any nonprofit can create a profile for free, and the more information they provide, the higher the seal of transparency they can earn. It's kind of like a better business bureau for nonprofits. So you can always supplement the Guide Star profiles with additional capital specific questions to help you make decisions about community grants. But again, this strategy would provide the information you need to make informed funding decisions while significantly reducing, again, the workload for both CBOs and city staff because you're using existing information that nonprofits can uh, have already. And then our last recommendation is to establish two to three types of community grants with varying award amounts and expectations that are proportional to the amount of funding required. So here are a few examples of what some of these recommendations could look like, starting with the priorities and alignment. So in this example, we're showing four priority areas using the core condition names, health and wellness, life on learning and education, community connectedness, and stable, affordable housing and shelters. And under those, we've named some areas of community need that we heard council members identify during the interviews. And so their um, thoughts, their feedback, their statements, you know, were partly informed by the data in the community profile, as well as other data they, they were aware of, and uh, their own interactions with community members. And then with the limited knowledge we have, we included some examples of how those areas of community need might align with the city's budget principles, other plans, existing efforts, or other city investments. And so we know this is incomplete analysis, and we're not proposing that these should be the four priority areas. Um, but if you decide to adopt this particular recommendation about selecting three to four, you know, uh, creating that or identifying an alignment, this type of matrix can provide a starting place to do that more thorough analysis. 
In this example here, this is about the fields of transparency. We wanted to show you the types of information that nonprofits can provide in their guide star profiles and show you how the more information that's provided, the higher the field of transparency that can be earned. And basically, so if you see it's a first level bronze, um, the minimum amount of information that a nonprofit needs to provide to get a bronze seal is based on agency overview. The contact information, mission statement, the subject or topic areas they cover, uh, target populations they serve, and information about their agency leaders. So pretty standard information um, and pretty basic, pretty minimal. Um, to earn a silver seal, an organization would have to provide everything in the bronze level and provide more information about their programs, the program names and descriptions, the geographic areas that it serves, and then each kind of level you go up, you have to provide everything in the previous level plus more. And if you were to look on GuideStart, you might see some organizations that actually have a bronze seal, but you still see things like their financials or information about their board. Um, and you might wonder, well, why don't they have a gold seal? And it's because they, they there's something at the silver level that they uh, must not have provided or decided to include. So, um, you know, we have a number of nonprofits in Santa Cruz County that already have a seal. There are Austin Man looks, 31 nonprofits with a bronze seal, 41 have a silver, 20 have a gold, and 23 nonprofits have a platinum seal. Um, and there are a number of nonprofits that don't have a seal yet, um, but they could. And um, some nonprofits don't have a guide store profile at all, but again, they could. And there's a lot of TA technical assistance available through Candid. That's basically like the arm of guide star that handles all the fields of transparency. Um, and there are times when we've offered some of that kind of learning and, and technical support as part of the Court Institute to help nonprofits fill out their profiles because it could be beneficial to them outside of any specific grant process. And so what this tells us is that many nonprofits, including some that you currently fund, already may already have profiles that could potentially be repurposed as your community grant application. And then here's our last example that we wanted to share in terms of you know, ways to think about types of community grants. So in all of the interviews, you should be recognized that part of the challenge of the community grant program is that there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach that will work for all situations. And so our recommendation here is to establish two to three types of grants to address that conundrum. And so for the purposes of this example, we call these three types of grants operational, outcome, and impact grants. And we described a few characteristics, such as grant size or amount of awards, the number of awards you grant, the purpose of the grant, and the application and data or reporting expectations that would then distinguish one type of grant from another. And the overall concept is that the grant expectations would be scaled to reflect the grant size or amount. So you can see that different ranges of grant sizes or awards uh, correspond with each type of grant. So we've included some sample ranges here. You might decide to set different minimum and maximum dollar amounts, so don't get it hung up on the actual number that's in there. The actual number of awards granted, you know, would depend on the amount you have allocated for community grants, but one way to think of it in this type of model is you might award more of the small operational grants, fewer of the medium outcomes grants, and mm -hmm. probably the least of the larger impact. And then each type of grant might serve a different purpose. So small grants to support general operating costs, outcomes grants to support implementation and or evaluation of programs that directly benefit capital residents, and impact grants would be a way for capital to co-fund or contribute to broader initiatives that may directly or indirectly benefit capital residents. And so being clear about the purpose of each grant will help you set the appropriate expectations about the level of detail required in applications and reports. So for instance, it would make sense to require less detail in both the application and reports for small grants and more detail for larger grants. Um, although you'll see that for the impact grants, if you're co-funding or contributing to a broader initiative that another local funder maybe is administering, we're actually suggesting that you accept details of both the progress reports that are prepared and submitted to that other funder. Right? And if the work is already being done, it, it kind of lowers the burden for everyone involved. Um, and so 
you can see, we've also suggested, you know, maybe there's um, particular uh, skills of transparency, right, that you might want to uh, think about in terms of the amount of information that's already provided in Guidestar that you could then use with your uh, application. And so that is actually the end of our presentation. Um, and so we'll pause here to see if there are any questions for us. Yeah, thank you, Nicole and Nicole. Uh, council members have questions? Um, yes, Chloe, you had a question? Oh, no, I'm so sorry. I think that was an accident. I apologize. Oh, okay. Um, uh, council member Brooke. Thank you, Mayor Story. Nicole, how are you um, notifying the local nonprofits to use that Guide Star platform um, since this is kind of a model you're suggesting we, we implement? Mm -hmm. Well, Guide Star is its own, what they do a lot of their own kind of marketing and promotion. If uh, Capitola decided to use Guidestar in that way, where it would be function as your grant application. Um, you know, we would use resources that we have, like our core investments email list that we use to send announcements about different events and training and technical assistance opportunities. Like we would help make that known. Like um, you know, it's it's free, it's available, it's easy, it's probably information you already have from all your other grant proposals you've prepared, it's a matter of like putting it in that website um, so that you get your seal. And is it part of the, um, like I'm just trying to think of like best practice, right? Would we say to our local, our current list of nonprofits, this is a way we're going to be, you know, distributing the funds. I'm just trying to think of how to get our nonprofits on board with that. Or like if it goes away, what it happens if that organization doesn't exist it, or that platform doesn't exist anymore. I'm just trying to think of how to build in something that we're not familiar with. Yeah. With guide star. I think the in terms of getting nonprofits on board and aware, I think, you know, if and when the council decides, okay, yes, let's do this, that makes sense, that, you know, it's making use of information that nonprofits are likely to already have, you might need, you know, to plan for um, know, at least, you know, maybe a couple months of like making sure that nonprofits know this is your plan, here's why, and really explain the benefits, right, that it's meant to make things easier, more streamlined for them, as well as you as the funder. The platform itself, I mean, Guidestar, I'm going to off to my head how long it's been around, but it's, it's probably been around longer than, maybe, <laughs> I'm going to say since I've been alive, but I don't know if it's quite that old, but it's a, it's a long-standing, um, stable uh, platform. Uh, the, Field, I think is uh, maybe a relatively newer piece of the GuideStar platform. But even if that went away for some reason, you could still look at what information is collected in the profile and if organizations have created a profile before with all that information in there, you could still find ways to I think, repurpose that or use it as your you know, grant application. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, especially because we're trying to look at an equitable solution here. And so if GuideStar is a piece that would not allow for that, right, if an agency has been around and just didn't know about it for a long time and doesn't have a platinum, I wouldn't want to see them left out um, because they didn't use that platform. So I think um, that would be a discussion for council too have, but you've answered my question. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Councilmember Bertrand. Oh, thank you, Mayor. So, um, Nicole, um, and Nicole was just presented. <laughs> the last name, I'm awful, sorry. So, in the Platinum, 
there's an issue of you know sharing a broader goal than just capital i think i forget the words that were used in that so that necessarily brings up to me you know what's the process here you know so potentially we'd have to work with other uh cities and uh, parts of the community in santa cruz in general for trying to share a broader goal and try to identify that so do you have any suggestions or how has that been approached you know we're not in a vacuum but we, we definitely have to reach out to others so i was just wondering if you could address that uh, with some of the experiences you've had perhaps or some uh, maybe in the future we could talk about how to do that so that's sort of my general question yeah, you're talking about the impact grants, the large, kind of the largest size where you might co-fund or contribute to something broader. Exactly. Yeah, um, I, I appreciate. You know, there's a lot more chance to leverage. You know, you know the combined efforts to uh, fund. You know, and you know, but necessarily it would have to be something that has impact, not just in capital, the broader community, but we also feel the need. You know, in general, in this community to address that. So. Um, we don't necessarily work with other groups, you know, in this regard. So I was just wondering what your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's probably a, a few different way, at least a few different ways to approach it. Um, there are, you know, so one approach would be uh, looking first to see, you know, after you've decided what your three or four priority areas are then looking around the local community and, and local funders to see are there already some existing kind of broader initiatives like that that line up with the priorities that capital has selected that seem like a good fit where you would basically saying, oh, we want to be contributing to this larger effort because we believe it benefits the capital community. Here's our portion of that. And it might be that you grant it directly to an agency that is you know, delivering that program or service or um, part of that initiative, or it could be, for instance, um, the core investment funding process that's you know, in the middle of being figured out right now. So that actually is the model that the county and city of Santa are using, where they are going to co-fund uh, they're calling it a targeted impact grant that's a pretty substantial amount um, and uh, City of Santa Cruz has to face a kind of similar decision point like how how much do they need to know like their dollars are going specifically to Santa Cruz residents right but really they're saying like if we invest in something bigger to really get to that kind of where you're seeing change at a community level 10,000 at a time, 20,000 at a time, like that's not going to do it, right? It really needs to be more of a collective, collaborative funding effort. So you could look to, you know, are there existing efforts where you could, you know, um, is it provide a grant that contributes to that? Um, there might be something new that emerges, whether it's, and not, I'm not saying this would be it, but like kind of like how the opioid settlement dollars become available and, and it became clear that, oh, Instead of Capitola trying to build the capacity to figure out how to administer those services and, and, and administer those grants, right, it's the, uh, our partnering with the county to kind of lead that work. Um, well, do you have any other thoughts that come to mind in terms of like how to approach the, the large, the impact grant? Yeah, just, just that what adding to what Nicole Young said that you know this has been grappled with recently it's not completely simple and straightforward but it is possible and it requires you know setting aside some of the emphasis on a particular um, tie between the, of funding and a result and, and looking at this broader view of the county and health and well-being countywide but also just to the earlier point um, that council member Brooks raised, these kinds of streamlining of um, information for multiple purposes, so whether it's for the smaller types of grants or these larger ones that we've just been discussing, 
part of the, the benefit accrues to the applicants because they're only providing information uh, once instead of over and over with slightly different formats, but it also accrues to those of you reviewing the, um, the applications and the, the aspirations of, of grantees because um, so much effort goes into those, as, as you know, whether they're large, medium, small, um, so much effort goes into those um, descriptions and to compiling information and so at, at all of these um, sizes of, of requests it, there's really an opportunity to um, to use the effort um, in multiple ways and, and to um, to not have to just keep recreating that for both staff and applicants so that's part of the reason that that we were drawn to the um, the guide star kind of model or, or repurposing other other applications. If I could have a follow-up there. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. So in your presentation, um, well, joint presentation, it was identified that um, somewhere, you know, rather uh, surprised at the high cost of child care, even as opposed to tuition for UC Santa Cruz. And that seems to me is something that in this community, and I think members of our board have addressed this in the past, is, is a very needed aspect. We, we need to have adequate child care if parents are going to be able to pursue the careers and also added child care is very beneficial for a jump in life um, at an early age especially. So, so we have an identified need, would, would it perhaps a way to Answer my question is, you know, we feel this is an identified need and then reach out to other communities here like Santa Cruz uh, County or uh, South Valley and say, you know, just have an effort just amongst ourselves to say, okay, this is something we've identified and is this something you'd like to join with us in terms of funding together, say working with Cabrillo so that one of the programs would start producing uh, qualified uh, um, child care uh, personnel, et cetera. So, you know, it's that reaching out that gets me, and you know, maybe the core process does that, but, you know, it, it may be confined to just, you know, in a way that may not be as um, available to everyone, that's all. Yeah, I think that, if I'm, if I'm following you, if I'm sorry. Right. Yes, yes, uh, reaching out, like if you know that if you've identified a need and you have ideas about um, where or how to award a, you know, an, a large impact grant and you have ideas about the partners and what, they, what their role might be, yes, you could certainly go that route too of reaching out and initiating something. And um, that can often uh, take a lot of work if, it's your, if you're kind of building those partnerships and that, you know, approach or the program or whatever it is, you know, from scratch, it's kind of a matter of how much capacity you have, right, or how much um, time or interest you'll have, you know, among your staff, among yourselves to, to do that kind of reaching out and, and building versus finding something where there's maybe a structure, an initiative, a something in place that you've been contributing to something that is already in the works. Thank you. Are there other questions from council members on the uh, report? Uh, seeing none, um, I think I'm, I'm going to take this opportunity to just check in uh, with the members of the public if there are any. Um, Larry, I don't, I don't see any attendees. Um, but could you confirm that we haven't received any phone calls or emails on this agenda? Sure. Sure, sorry, you're right. I don't see anything in on the side of, and it doesn't look like we've received any email. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll bring it back to council, um, and um, just to, you know, the um, recommended action is to receive the report and provide direction. Um, are there um, maybe some feedback or direction to Nicole and Nicole on um, the uh, program? Um, so far. Yeah, something in the brown. 
Thank you. That was um, that was an incredibly informative presentation. Thank you so much for all the work that you've put into this. Um, there was a, a lot of information there. It was really um, informative, but really also information dense. And I, I have a hard time um, thinking that I could process all of our priorities, the fields of transparency, the guide star program, you know, all of that within um, this one meeting. And so I'm wondering if there's an opportunity, and maybe this is something that staff could help me um, work through, for this presentation that you just provided to us uh, to be sent to each of the council members for us to kind of break down individually. Because I think that we're all going to have our own thoughts on what our priorities should be, whether or not this field of transparency guide star program should be in included, et cetera. And so my thought is if others on the council would agree that we could have this presentation sent to us, we can each consider our thoughts on it, and then perhaps this could be brought back to us maybe in May so that we could have um, a more informed um, discussion about it. And I don't mean informed in the sense that we didn't get a lot of information just now because we absolutely did. Um, I just personally need a little bit more time to digest this kind of information and consider um, what I feel would be the most, um, the best way forward. And so that's, that's my thought um, of, about this item. And, and again, thank you so much to both of the Nicoles. I had interviews with you and, and seeing um, the presentation of, of what you heard from other council members bringing that in from what you heard from community organizations, from what you heard from, or what you saw on the um, kind of demographics and, and the information about our city. It's all incredibly informative and it's almost overwhelming how informative it is, which is the only reason that I ask that uh, perhaps we can have this information uh, to think about personally and then come back. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story, and thank you to the Nicoles. Um, you know, I love data, and I love all of this sort of stuff, and I'm thrilled to have it before us. This has really been a challenge for myself, um, and and what I've seen from our council members in the last several years of trying to get to this point of having the data and being able to set these priorities. Uh, this is something that Council Member Brown and I um, has been tasked with without all of this data and information as subcommittee members. Um, I'm almost thinking, and, and maybe this is, uh, you know, if council would oblige, um, is that, and council member Brown, just an idea, about um, you and I going back to the table with this information and really um, uh, organizing it, looking at the data that was presented to us today setting, um, picking those priorities, very similar to what we did with the CDBG grant, um, and presenting that information to council so um, it offsets that workload. I'd be willing to take that on um, in, in again, using the data. It's not like we have to make it up. We're not, we're using what the tools we now have, allocating those percentages as, um, as suggested in the recommendation and then bringing that, that back to full council. So if, Council Member Brown nods in agreement and then the rest of council is okay with it. Maybe um, that's a way in terms of moving forward. Um, um, so that, those are just my thoughts. And again, thank you to everyone. And that information was um, not so, it's shocking, but not so shocking, right? It's, it's what we've all been thinking really was occurring in our community. Was Council Member Brown nodding yet? <laughs> of course, if there's, um, if I'm able to be on a committee uh, with Council Member Brooks to, to kind of look at this information and bring back a recommendation to the council while we're all considering these um, recommendations from the Nicole's, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you. But, you know, maybe before we go to the last thing to create a committee, um, let me go to Council Member Brooks. Yeah, um, you know, my question to Nicole uh, before we went to comments was, you know, basically focused on, you know, what's the possibilities of implementation? And, you know, I was prepared for this second phase of our discussion when I thought that um, we should pair up and group the two, sort of like what uh, Yvette is talking about, not necessarily committees, 
but that we use those groups of twos. Um, I worked with the vice mayor, of course, and um, as just pointed out, there was um, a further effort with Kristen and Nicole, um, Yvette. So the basic thing here to me is understanding clearly what the information is. And you know, I agree that the information, as Kristen mentioned, there's a lot here and it's reflective of how much work was put in to prepare the report, which you know I fully I respect that effort. And it's also up to us to actually understand clearly what the depth of that information is so that we can actually come to some sort of way to um, implement, which that's sort of, to me, the goal, the end goal. So you know, I think we should pair up, and I think um, an adequate amount of time we come back to the board and um, not to leave Sam stranded because it is a board of five. I think that in terms of implementation, uh, Sam working with the city manager would be very critical because there's a whole aspect of you know how that would work with our budget. Uh, there's an idea of line items, et cetera. So you know there's some functionality issues there that might be very important. And um, a lot of us recognize that Sam's very much involved in the nonprofit community for many, many years and community um, bridges. So, you know, maybe his wisdom there could actually help us in regards to uh, how we implement some of the things that are being suggested here as to moving forward. So, those are my ideas, not necessarily a, uh, a committee, but that we individually focus together as a group in various ways so that we can come to some ideas how we're going to implement. Thank you, Council Member Good Train. Um, are there any other comments from Council Members? Um, seeing none, um, I guess I, I wanted to maybe just reflect on um, the recommendations that were uh, presented uh, in the staff report um, and, and then maybe talk a little bit about um, the entire uh, community structure. Um, if that council's will to go in that direction. Um, I think the recommendations I'm, I'm overall have uh, been supportive of. Uh, I did have some questions about some of them, and, and at this stage, I'm um, kind of unsure how they would work in relationship to our community grant program. And obviously, it's one, the one that I have lived with for many years and familiar with and um, uh, but just to speak to um, one the first recommendation was about organizing this around the, the core conditions for health and well-being um, and um, I wasn't quite sure uh, I, I mean I, I, I see the eight core conditions but they seem pretty broad and I'm not sure what about what is underlying within each one of those conditions um, and in such a way that it's not going to tie our hand to eliminate somebody that we may want to support uh, in the future. Um, I mean, just for example, when I'm thinking about the disability community, I'm not quite sure where that fits within one of those um, that conditions of health and well-being. I'm sure it does. Uh, and, and it's there somewhere, but I guess I would want to have you come back and, and show us in more detail um, and thinking in relationship to our past experiences of uh, community programs, with that where, where would this one fit? Does it fit into uh, those four conditions? Um, and, you know, my interest is being um, as flexible and broad as possible for the council um, and um, as when it comes to implementation. Um, the second recommendation concerning allocating an equal percentage of the um, community grant program mm -hmm. funds across the priority area. Um, that's just, I mean, it, that, that seems to me may end up being kind of arbitrary and not sitting I necessarily uh, a demographic party. Um, we've already identified that we have, you know, the greatest percentage of seniors in the county over the age of 65, um, and um, 
you know, and according to the census uh, um, data, the fastest growing um, population group are those uh, 80 and over. Um, so, and, and also, uh, also realizing that we have the highest percentage of, of children that are living in poverty. Um, seems to me that we would want to not just kind of equalize the community grants, but be able to divide them in a way that, um, you know, um, matches the demographics or, or in, in another way to say it is to me, um, you know, um, the recommendations for multi-year grants, I think, is, is a great one, um, and otherwise uh, trying to increase stability and leveraging, I think those are excellent uh, criteria. Using GuideStar, um, I'm not familiar with standing skills with transparency. I'm supposed to learn about it, um, uh, but I'm familiar with GuideStar and using that as a template uh, for the community program. Um, I think um, um, would facilitate, um, you know, I, I, I just uh, reducing some of the bureaucracy um, in the process. Uh, and the last recommendation concerning establishing two or three types of community grants, and, and you know, I'm mostly familiar and experienced with direct service grants, um, where it's kind of, you know, we expect units of service to be delivered to capital residents, and uh, we want to hear about what those were. Um, and I'm just, I'm, I'm a little um, unclear about how uh, impact grants uh, or outcome grants um, would, um, uh, how they would work. I would like to maybe learn more about those, if those are going to be a component of what we are going to fund using the community grant program. I know we have other funding, um, such as the opioid funding, uh, you know, the, um, and, you know uh, the HAP funding, which is separate from community programs that we participate in. And in a sense, those are maybe impact funding, but um, particularly tied to our community grant uh, budget. Um, and that, I, I just don't know, and I would want to learn more about how impact grants would be utilized for that sort of funding. Um, and I, I'm not quite sure we and my staff have the expertise in time to basically assess and, and monitor and evaluate whether an impact grant has been successful. Um, so um, I guess those are my reactions to the recommendations uh, concerning now, you know, the committee, I'm, I think that it would be um, very helpful for Council Member Brooks and Council Member Brown who were originally part of phase one to come back and kind of overlay these recommendations with uh, um, and come to some concrete uh, recommendations of how we can implement um, you know, the, the next phase of our uh, community grant transition. Um, and Jacques, I, um, I think it would um, have a multiple set of recommendations come back to us. Um, that just seems overwhelming to me. Um, and it, 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 it could just you know, kind of diverge us all um, into um, you know, I think different directions, which may be hard to reconcile. And realizing that any two council members can get together and, and talk about the assignment uh, in any event, um, and I imagine some of us would, would um, but um, my preference wouldn't be to allow Council Member Brown and Council Member Brooks to be the formal committee um, and they could report back to us and of course we would then be able to respond uh, to those recommendations. So just my thoughts um, on that question, but I see um, that Council Member Brown has her hand that um, I'll call on her at this time. Thank you, Mayor Story. I, um I agree with your, your thoughts in the uh, idea that regardless of any committee structure, all council members, or not all council members, but other council members are, are free to discuss with each other within the confines of the Brown Act. And I think that 
it would be a great opportunity uh, come May for us each, regardless of the of a committee with um, Councilmember Brooks and myself, for all of us to take the time to consider this information that's been brought to us, how we would feel would be uh, the best way to move forward. And then uh, if Councilmember Brooks and I can come up with a recommendation, then each council member that has also considered this information could uh, give their feedback then on whether or not they agree with whatever recommendation we might we might come up with. Okay, um, with that, I think it may be um, appropriate for us to just, you know, maybe a vote have an agreement on um, the committee to work with uh, Nicole and Holt on the next phase um, of this uh, effort. Or is, is there, Vice Mayor Kaiser, do you want to so move? Definitely, I will move that as long as uh, Councilmember Brown and Brooks are on board with that. Thank you. Yes, yeah, that they are. Um, and um, is there a second? Second. Yeah, um, I'm going to accept uh, uh, Councilmember Bertrand's second. Uh, thank you on that. Um, and also, um, well, I, I don't think we need to make the report at this time. Um, and uh, but so Chloe, I'll, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Councilmember Bertrand. I approve. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Um, and the report is received. Thank you, Nicole and Nicole. Um, and I hope you've got the necessary direction from us. Um, and we look forward to uh, having you come back um, you know, at a May meeting to give us maybe not the conclusion at that point but the next update on the next day um and thank you for helping us tackle this it is a difficult job um you know uh, as you said we realize that um and um so i think if we all work together we'll get through it and come out with a good pilot that we have in the end uh, so thank you so much um and uh, with that i'm going to take us on to the next uh, item on tonight's agenda, which is item 9B, which is to consider a community survey contract and the recommended action is to authorize the city manager to enter into a contract with Gene Gregman and Associates in an amount not to exceed $17,000 for a community survey um, to help gauge public interest on potential ballot measures for the November election. Um, and approve the proposed resolution amending the 2122 Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. In a second to share my screen. How does that look, Mr. Moderator? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Mayor Story. All right, good evening, everybody. So during this year's goal setting session, City Council identified a goal to evaluate possible ballot measures in anticipation of the November 22 general election. Since that time, staff has met with the Finance Advisory Committee to discuss potential tax measures to consider polling. Uh, based on the facts reviewed, they recommended uh, pulling a second home tax. And I'll have more details about that a little bit later on in the presentation. The value of community polling. Uh, for those of you who've been on council for a while, you've probably heard me make these statements before, but I really do have, I think it's always wise to poll before putting something on the ballot. It helps inform the decision uh, about whether a measure should be placed on the ballot or not. Helps identify priorities. Uh, for example, whether uh, funding should be devoted towards parks or streets or the beaches or what, the polling helps give you sort of a guide to a statistically relevant way about what voters might think. And then lastly, um, it really can help avoid putting measures that are unlikely to pass on the ballot. I think having measures fail is, is, 
is a bad outcome for the city. Um, you know, I've heard people in the past argue that it's a relatively low cost thing to do, but nevertheless, I think the legacy of seeing things not pass uh, suggests to everybody that the city isn't isn't um, isn't as aligned with its community as it probably should be. Um, so the proposed contract is for seventeen thousand uh, dollars. Gene has conducted a number of recent surveys for the city and have tiers. Uh, the survey, we hope, would likely include between 175 and 200 uh, Capitola voters. Mr. Berrigan is on the call and he can talk more about the challenges of getting those number of voters, which in the past has been a challenge, although I recall last time around when we were polling around the pandemic during the shutdown, um, it was really easy to get people to answer their phone then because they were looking for something to do which was a different experience. So some items that council may want to consider polling. Um, one is the second home tax. This is something that I remember council member Bertrand brought up a while ago. Um, it's a relatively new idea in California. It's been really only implemented as far as I can tell in the city of Oakland. I think there was a lot of questions about its legality at the time. Uh, but it has withstood with legal challenge and it really does appear to be a legal tax. The Oakland example applies to homes that are uh, occupied for less than 50 days in a year. Uh, the tax is an annual three to $7,000, depending on whether it's a single family home or a, um, a unit in a multi-unit apartment. There are exemptions for low income residents, for houses that are in active construction, for things like that. According to the most recent census, there's 410 units in Capitola that are identified as seasonal, recreational, or occasional use. And then another about 100 units that are classified as other vacant. I don't think all of the other vacants would likely be subject to the tax. I suspect that there are units in there that are going through probate, that are in construction, um, that would probably be exempt from this tax, although obviously we don't know what this tax would look like. We haven't written the ordinance yet. So, but that gives you a feeling for the number of units that we're talking about. Um, the rationale behind this tax is, is, is pretty clear. It's the, the notion that, you know, homes that are, that are being used as second homes often are largely sitting vacant and are unavailable as part of the overall housing stock. Um, so this is a way to disincentivize second home ownership. Um, San Francisco, according to the media reports, is considering such a tax coming up here in the next uh, this, this next election cycle. And in the city of Santa Cruz, there's a community group that I understand that is pushing to get this tax on the ballot as well. The fact did recommend this as an item to consider polling. Um, and so that's sort of a summary of the second home tax. Sales taxes. Uh, the city has the ability to put on extra sales taxes. They're called district taxes. They often come in quarter uh, quarter percent increments, but they don't have to. They can come in a half, you can have a half cent local uh, district tax. Each quarter cent generates about a million dollars a year. Um, one of the challenges behind the sales tax, particularly the district taxes, is that over time they have not been keeping up with inflation. Uh, they've been just about a million dollars for the last decade. Uh, and the challenge behind that is if it's an ongoing revenue source, um, basically their buying power just goes down a little bit over time. And that's one of the hardest things for local government to deal with. You know, we can respond to a major recession where we have to cut back, but if each year you're sort of having to gently tighten the belt, it gets harder and harder over time. I do think that these district taxes can be particularly useful tool the way we're utilizing it now with the war, where it's over a fixed period of time and it's for a specific project. So if there's a specific project that the council wanted to target funding, uh, I think that the, the limited term sales tax could be worth considering and could be worth polling uh, and then getting a little bit of feedback, getting a little bit of feedback staff to poll different sort of voter reception to dedicating all the funding to roads, dedicating it to recreation, dedicating it to um, public safety, what it, we can come up with what, what different items to consider polling. Uh, utility user tax, you'll recall that two years ago we had pretty significant conversations about that. Uh, and in fact, we did poll it. The utility user tax, everybody 
pays on their utility bills, and you can um, levy the tax on water bills, and sewer bills, home bills. Um, the challenge is, is that as opposed to the second home tax and the uh, sales tax, it, it's only paid by capital of residents. And in addition, you may remember that the poll results in 2020 suggested it was going to be very hard to get that passed. And um, my recommendation is that I don't think the economic climate has grown more favorable for something like this to pass. So I don't think that it's very likely that we would, if this is worth polling, um, because I don't think it's very likely that there's going to be voter support for it. And then, of course, there's other options. Uh, we've most recently adjusted our TOT, but council has the discretion to pull a TOT change. Um, and then there are obviously other kinds of taxes we can discuss further. So. Uh, the process would be if we authorize this contract tonight, the goal is to bring back the results at the first June meeting, and then in June and July we would put together uh, an item if we determine we want something, uh, put together an item to go on to the ballot, and our final date to take action on that is August 12th. But you'll remember we don't have a scheduled meeting that first week in August, so we would need to get it done by July or schedule a special meeting. So with that, the recommendation is to enter into the contract with Team Bregman and Associates in an amount not to exceed $17,000 for polling and to approve the proposed resolution amending the current year budget and then provide direction to staff around items to consider including in the poll. I will note that Team Bregman is on the call and available to answer any questions should council members want to speak with them directly. With that, I'm available for questions. Thank you, Jamie. Are there questions from council members? Seeing none, um, Jimmy, I, I had, um, well, Council Member Bertrand, go ahead. You're on mute. Uh, since Gene is available right now, um, so, so we're in an inflationary period right now, and so I was just wondering if you would comment on that and, you know, us considering extra taxes. Um, are, are, completely understand what our city manager is talking about. You know, we're getting a little bit squeezed as inflation increases our expenses. So we need some more revenue. So that's the reality here. And with those two concepts in mind, I, I understand you phrased questions and partially it's to um, help the public understand, you know, where we are. And, uh, you know, we're just not asking for taxes for the the purpose of getting more money you know, just flat but because we have challenges. So I was just wondering if you could try to address those two maybe counter issues, the inflationary issues, and you know, the rising need of city government expenses, which is pretty obvious. Sure. So I do think that the inflationary issue certainly would make the EUT even harder to pass. Um, and I suspect could play a role in the sales tax. Um, I do think that the second home tax may have a different reception. Um, second home tax isn't on people that live in Capitola. You know, it's people that are, are occupying homes, well, taking homes out of our inventory, if you will. So I do suspect that that may have a slightly different reception, but it is a new concept. And so the question of voter understanding of how that would work is certainly uh, an open question. I, I think that, um, that that would take a little bit more explanation during the course of the service to know what we're talking about. Um, you know, but as far as you know, the effect of inflation, it's going to make anything a little more difficult to pass. Uh, but things still pass, and they do in, in all kinds of economic situations, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, and it, we just see what the I mean, the capital of residents of generally been pretty open to, to in their city and what the city needs. And we, so we measure that and we compare that to previous results and how much need they think the city has for more money and what, the, what areas they want to see the money, if there is more money where it should go, and then try to see if any of these possible tax measures are uh, valuable to, to the voters that need to be. Now, the one thing that's uh, the past sales tax measures have uh, been 50% plus one, I think, I've changed them. Oh. Uh, so there is 
a danger if you want to make a, a sales tax measure or any measure for that matter that's specifically for one and one, only one purpose, that will then require a two-thirds election, which will make it much more difficult rather than a general tax that goes to the general fund. But that's that's the kind of stuff that we find out in the poll. Yeah, Mr. Bergman, would a vacant home tax be a simple majority if, if it was not um, dedicated money? Uh, you know, I, I don't, I'm not that familiar with that tax, but I assume that it would be if it's just the general tax where the money goes to the general fund. Yeah, it would be. Um, the determination about the vote required for a tax is not what type of tax it is, it's where the money goes. So if the money just goes into the general fund, it's the general tax, so it's a simple majority. If the money is designated, it goes in, it's a special tax, and so that requires two thirds. It's just, this may be getting into the weeds, but if the city did decide that it wanted to do a tax measure, it could do it as a general tax, so it only requires a simple majority. And then you could also put on the ballot an advisory measure that would decide the city on how to spend the funds. Yeah, thank you uh, for that uh, response. Um, and and uh, also, uh, Mr. Bregman, uh, you know, I think a lot of residents aren't going to know what a vacant home tax is. Um, mm -hmm. And you mentioned that you, you would provide would have to provide some. Um, description uh, in the survey, would you also include scenarios of how that tax would be enforced? Um, if we have some idea. So that, so first off, a couple things. I've done a little bit of research into this, uh, Mr. Mayor, and number one is I think we're going to be, I think the, the way best described it is a second home tax. I think the vacant home tax is confusing for people. Um, secondarily, I have done a little bit of research into the feasibility of sort of different mechanisms to enforce this because I think the enforcement, for me at least, was my number one question. Uh, was it, it didn't seem like a feasible tax to enforce. Uh, and according to our initial research, we do think the utility records could be used uh, to enforce, which I think that, that would actually give a mechanism, a credible mechanism about how you'd be doing this other than just on the honor system. Thank you for that. Um, Council Member Brooke. Thank you, Mayor Story. This is a question for Jamie. Um, so, you know, Council made this a priority without really, uh, without any end, goal, end result, like a total amount. And when we're looking at, um, we know we're just some deficit spending or with our increased cost to retirement and all, we know kind of some of those things. but. I, I'm wondering if you looked at the TOT, and I understand that it is a different type of vote, but we were successful in the last one, and that if we did an X amount of percent, would we get to, would it be enough compared, comparing it to, say, the second home um, tax? So I'm just wondering, like, if they would, you know, one of them you get, $5 million out of a year out of it, and it when you get $500. I'm just wondering which one's more effective for what we're trying to accomplish here in taxation. So the simple answer is that the second home tax, if, if there's really 400 units um, and you use the Oakland $8,000 per year, um, $8,000 times four, that's $3 million. Um, one percent of TOT is about two hundred thousand dollars. So they are sort of different orders of magnitude, if you will. So yes, the TOT uh, one percent TOT is about two hundred thousand dollars. <throat> the Oakland second home tax, second home tax, would be significantly more. Obviously, council would have to set what the tax rate is, and we would pull different tax rates to see if that had an impact on uh, potential. And, and did you look at, um, in terms of the second home, I and mean, we just got some staggering data from the Nicoles on on who our residents are, and you know, if these are residents who are local residents with second homes, and they're seniors on fixed incomes, or, you know, I'm just trying to think of like, the effect really on this type of taxation. Have, will we get that information? 
should we should we approve going out for this? You know, would we get that kind of data before going out? So the first thing, the option tonight would be to just you know give guidance about items to pull. Um, and you know, one of the item I didn't mention is, is I'm really looking forward to seeing the poll results on some of our different uh, community outreach mechanisms to see what what's resonating, what people are seeing, using to get information about the city. So that's kind of a side benefit of the poll is you can ask questions about who bad, those sorts of things. Now, what would come back to you would be the results of the poll. Uh, and then in addition, staff would do a whole lot more research into these questions about what are appropriate exemptions? What would this tax look like? How many days per year would a home have to be vacant to be considered the second home? All of those questions. And so that information would come back in a package to you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on the report? Seeing none, I'm going to quickly go out to the public. Um, again, I see no attendees. Um, just want to <laughs> check Larry, confirm there's no email um, or phone calls. Very sorry, we, we have not received it. Okay, I'll uh, bring it back to the council then for further uh, deliberation and possible action. Is the council member ready to dive in? Yes, Vice Mayor Kaiser. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to authorize city manager to enter a contract with Gene Bergman and Associates in the amount to not exceed $17,000 for community survey. To, to keep going to continue <laughs> or sorry to help gauge public interest on potential ballot measures for the November election and approve the proposed resolution amending the fiscal year 2021-2022 budget. I'll second that. So we have a motion and a second and I'll call on Council Member Brown. Thank you. Uh, I guess I have a, a question I, or a comment first and then a question about the motion. Um, my comment is I, I have concerns about polling on the utility tax because we already polled on that last time and it wasn't favorable. And I'm, to our city manager's point, I don't expect it will be favorable this time. A lot of the same pandemic um, issues that we had um, when we were starting to control, when we pulled on it last time, it wasn't very favorable, but I can't remember, was that during pandemic times or pandemic hasn't started? Yeah, it was during pandemic times, right? So, I mean, to the point that we're still virtual, I think it's going to be difficult for um, for our residents to say, oh, well, the pandemic's over, so I'm willing to pay a utility tax, even though our council members are still meeting virtually because the pandemic's not over. So I have concerns about pulling on that particular tax, and I would hope that we would consider not including that this time around. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm um, okay with everything else that, that's been considered, all the other um, opportunities and, and considerations. Um, I think that, uh, is it possible to pull up, was there a slide? I thought there was a slide about the, the optional taxes, you know? Yes. Thank yeah. You. Uh, Just back. Yes. Back up, back up. Sorry, it's not wanting to backwards. The little arrows aren't working well. I will try this way. Can you go forward until it goes back? I can do this. So I mentioned the second home tax, the idea of like a sales mm -hmm. tax, which I suggested is yeah. either restricted or for a limited term for an, with an intent around it. Okay. There's the um, ET with, yeah, and then other options. Yeah, if you can go back to the one before that. Perfect. So I'm uh, I'm in favor of pulling on the second home tax um, and, as well as the sales tax, uh, especially the second home tax because the FAF recommended it. I, I have a lot of um, faith in, in the Finance Advisory Committee's recommendations. Um, yeah, I have concern about the utility user taxes. Even if we weren't to put um, an advisory measure on the ballot, I would appreciate if we could at least poll to the public 
if you had a choice, what would you want this funding to go to? To give us an idea, because even if we don't put it on the ballot and, and some of these things end up being just a general tax that goes into our general fund, I think it's good to have an idea of what people expect us to use it for. Um, it, I, yeah, that's, those are my thoughts on that. Um, so, so I know there's already a motion in the second, and I'm wondering if the maker of the motion and the seconder would be willing to amend to just indicate that the utility user tax is not part of the polling this time around, um, based on just my thoughts on this issue. Thank you. Yeah, I'm totally fine with that. Um, that was sort of the impression that I was under after Jamie's presentation, but thank you for clarifying, and that is in line for me. Thank you. Um, I, um, as a seconder, I don't mind uh, making that change, but I have a question of Gene in regards to um, this uh, change on the utility tax, if I may. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Dr. Number So I, I thought about the same thing that Kristen talk, talked about recently. And so the conclusion I got was that maybe having various options there, people are thinking in terms of comparison. So I agree, utility tax, we thought it was great, but utility rates are going up. I'm on the sanitation commission, and we definitely uh, uh, um, increased that, and you know I got some feedback on that, but it's just the way things are in terms of our climate. So I was question to G, if, if, if we took utility tax off as proposed, or if we left it on, what do you think in terms of the effect, in terms of the public, when they see either two or three, you know, the idea of comparison uh, between two, the idea of comparison between three, which I think is correct, that the third one, the utility, is, is not going to be likable. So I'm just trying to get some ideas. What do you think about that since you've been doing polling? Well, it, it's always cleaner to do two than three. For obvious reasons, it is two fewer choices. But if, it, if you you don't want to pull something that's not a possibility, and you all have indicated here, and actually when Jamie and I first talked about uh, doing the poll uh, a few weeks ago, the first thing we agreed upon was I don't think we should just do it exactly this time. So. Um, I think that's it, it's almost kind of a, a moot point that if it's not something that you're going to consider anyway, uh, then I wouldn't I would bother asking. That was my question. Uh, I will second the motion, the amendment motion. Okay. Thank you. Any other um, council um, comment on the motion? Um, seeing none. Um, I guess before we take a vote on the motion, um, I think I'll just weigh in, and I certainly agree that uh, the utility tax is the amount of focus time to be considered now. Um, and, you know, in this era of inflation. Um, and um, I, I also have serious reservations about the second home or vacant, vacant home uh, tax as well. Um, and, um, it, it, it seems to me that there's already a potential initiative taking place in the city of Santa Cruz on that question. Um, I've already have observed, you know, significant opposition uh, developing uh, toward it. I think it's going to be a very controversial issue uh, in the city of Santa Cruz, and um, and if we were to move forward uh, in a like manner, I think that we would get been dragged down uh, with what's going there now. Um, I think the sales tax is probably the pull on is the most palatable tax, and particularly concerning the continuation of the measure after the temporary tax and, um, and uh, scheduled the sunset in uh, 2027. I mean, with that, this may be a little premature. The pull on that at this time. Um, and then, and so um, those are my thoughts. I, and I would just 
Uh, I'm going to support the motion. I think it's always good to survey the residents uh, for this thoughtful part of their attitudes about how they view the city and how they view the city. Uh, I think it's good for that effort to get that feedback. Um, but, you know, I'll just, you know, when it comes to, to taking a vote on whether or not we're going to put a second home tax on the ballot, uh, I would probably be most likely a no vote on that um, question. So, um, those are my comments. Before I ask for the vote, I'll call on uh, Council Member Brown. Well, and, and I apologize, this might be kind of a silly question. We've had some polling or community outreach before that we had determined was going to happen, and then my phone got a text or a call in the poll or the community outreach. So I just want to clarify ahead of time, should council members be abstaining from participation in these kinds of polls if it was a call or text? That would be recommended. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a good question, council member. Yeah. Um, with that, um, I'll um, call for a roll call vote. Council member Bertrand. I agree. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. The motion passes unanimously, um, which will bring us to our next item, which is to adopt the resolution declaring an emergency for storm drain repairs in Noble Gulf Falls. Um, Thank you all very much. I'll see you in a few weeks. Oh, thank you, Greg. Thank you. thank you, Mr. Bergman. Um, and um, adopt the resolution. And the recommended action is to adopt the resolution one, declaring an emergency, um, two, authorize procurement and services without giving notice to bid, um, and authorize the staff to enter the into a contract with Granite Rock, um, three, approve the budget amendment, transferring 60000 from the emergency reserve fund to the capital improvement project fund uh, and authorize the creation of a new project entitled Noble Gold Spark Storm Drain Project. And uh, Dave, you're going to uh, lead us in this? I am. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Uh, I need to share my screen. Larry, does that look okay? Yes, it does. Thank you. So the item before you is the title indicates is consideration of declaring an emergency repair project for a storm drain, pro storm drain located in Noble's Park. Um, I had mentioned this item uh, in oral communications at our last council meeting when we first when we first discovered it. We've since taken action, repaired it, and this is the uh, resolution necessary to uh, proceed with that action. Um, given that a picture is always worth a lot more than words, I uh, prepared this map just to kind of give everybody an idea of where the location was. I'll orient you. This is Monterey Avenue going up the hill toward New Brighton, Bay Avenue going toward Gales Bakery. So the green pipe here is the large Noble Boat pipeline. Um, so from Noble Boats Park all the way through the lower parking lot and to SoCal Creek. Um, and then this pipeline in red is the pipe that has failed. It is a 15 inch corrugated metal pipe for most of its length. It ties in with four other drains here and all, all of them connect into uh, the Noble Boats pipe here. The two black dots represent two areas where we've discovered a there is a bigger dot is where the pipe was actually broken and severed um, and it was the cause of the problems. We also did discover when we were videotaping it, a small hole by the size of a golf ball uh, where the smaller guy is upstream of that by about, I think it was 11 or 12 feet. That kind of gives you an idea. You can see we're right next to the sidewalk here. And a lot of people walk through this part of the park. So, Due to the location of the sinkhole next to the public sidewalk, it's determined that emergency action is ordered. We didn't want the sidewalk down, we didn't want somebody stepping off the sidewalk and into the sinkhole. 
Granite Rock uh, responded and was able to mobilize within two days, and we did issue them an emergency contract, which is included in your agenda. As far as the repairs that were made, work began on March 30th, and uh, as that work proceeded on the 30th, the depth of the pipe was significantly deeper than anticipated. I quickly go back to the picture. The depth of the pipe at this manhole up here is about four feet below top of the sidewalk. And we assumed it kind of went at that depth and remained at that depth to somewhere near the pipeline where in case it would dive down. We know that this was significantly deeper. But unfortunately, it goes at a constant grade. So it was uh, significantly deeper than Granite Rocket brought equipment for and uh, we, had, uh, we had anticipated. So they halted the first repairs, they filled in the hole, we knew there was nothing in there that could be excavated again. They started a second repair attempt on April 4th uh, with larger equipment. Uh, I have some pictures and I'll show you that in a minute. The pipe was approximately, the pipe a bigger break, was approximately 16 feet deep. And a new pipe was installed to fix both failed areas of the, of the pipe, of the corrugated metal pipe. We are recommending because we weren't able, we originally thought we might be able to replace the entire pipe, um, which we've done before when we've done repair projects. But due to the depth and the difficulties in working at that depth, uh, we did not continue with replacing the whole pipe. So we're recommending a re-inspection of the pipe in the future, probably in the three to five year range, um, just to make sure that the rest of the pipe that we left behind is causing a problem. And there's certainly a candidate for a slip lining project at that time, but further analysis will have to be made. Just to head off the question, we couldn't have slip lined this project and this project because of the disconnection or complete failure of the pipe at the, at the large dot on the map. Um, we couldn't have ever pulled the pipe through this. So we had to get down there and fix that for here before we proceeded with any slip lining. So now we can slip line it. Um, so here's some pictures that to give you an idea. This is the equipment sitting above the pole. You can see the pipe down here. In order to put men at that depth, they had to excavate a rather large hole. This is a 16-foot shield, as they call it. Uh, it's used for building manholes and accessing the pipes. Um, you can see the pipe down here. That's the, on the ground. Down below, um, it was hard to get a picture of the scale here, it's just a like a bunch of mud, so I didn't include it here. But you can see here's the existing pipe. We, we slipped just the beginning of a new pipe in there to match the size as much as we could at this point. And then in case there was a coupling put in here and then the whole reconnection was, was filled with concrete to make it strong and last a long time. So with that, the project is complete, and the recommended action tonight is to adopt a resolution to declare some emergency, which authorized our procurement of services without giving notice or bid for since public contract code 22050, and authorizing staff to enter into a contract for such services with Granite Rock Construction for repairs to the storm drain located at No Bloch Park the intersection of Bay Avenue and Monterey Avenue. The resolution also approves a budget amendment transfer of $60,000 from the Emergency Reserve Fund to the Capital Improvement Fund and authorizes the creation of a new project entitled the Noble Gold Park Storm Drain Repair Project. And before I uh, answer any questions, I just want to put $60,000. Um, when we initially thought it was at a much uh, shallower depth, we were in the $20,000 range. Um, I was actually out of town when re final repairs were done, and I left it with a $40,000 estimate. It's just the depth of the pipe kept bringing the project up, uh, project costs up, but we are very comfortable that we will not exceed the $60,000 amount uh, with the final billing. We we'll probably won't hear the final billing uh, based on other emergency projects for probably another 30 days. So we can provide a, a report at that time. Um, either on or off agenda, depending on where we come in at the top. So that's my report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Oh, Council Member Richard. You're on mute, Council Member. The, the drain on the street that's considered city facilities? Yeah, if any of the facilities that drain 
street flow are considered city facilities, not zone five. You got the gist of my question. Thank you. Any other questions from council members? Seeing none, um, Larry, I don't see any attendees. Um, just confirm that there's no email to the phone call. Fair story, I do not see any emails on this topic, and you're right, there are no attendees on this topic. Okay, I'll bring it back for a motion um, and a vote. I move approval of staff recommendations. Yeah, the motion by Councilman Brown. Is there a second? No, second. Seconded by Councilman Bertrand. Um, Chloe, can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Bertrand. I approve. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser Aye. and Mayor Story. Hi, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Steve, for taking care of that so promptly. Yeah. Thank you, Council. All right. Um, which will now bring us to um, item 9D, um, which is to consider a section to the municipal code in accordance with Assembly Bill 481, the action is to introduce for the first reading by title alone, waiving the full reading of the tax, an ordinance adding 2.6 of to the Council and Municipal Code, approving a military equipment use policy for police services. And um, Captain Dowdy, do you want to um, read us on this item? Yes, uh, <clears throat> good evening, Mayor and Council members. Uh, tonight, I'm presenting our uh, uh, recommendation to uh, move forward with the military funding acquisition and uh, use policy. It's uh, <clears throat> identified as Assembly Bill uh, 481. <clears throat> Real quick, you know, we're just going to talk a little bit about the purpose of the AB 481. We'll define what they have determined as military equipment. We'll talk a little bit about our current inventory. The proposed uh, policy, which is policy 706, uh, a little bit about the annual reporting requirements that are going to happen tonight and then hopefully uh, annually, and then coordination with our other jurisdictions, and then um, and then the, the recommendation. <clears throat> so, what is AP 481? It was a simple bill intended to create really transparency and accountability <clears throat> and oversight with the acquisition and use of military equipment. Um, it was offered by a family member out of San Francisco that was signed into law uh, in September of 2021 by Governor Newsom. It take, took effect January 1st and must be commenced by May 1st. <clears throat> part, of this, uh, part of this process would be required to uh, come up with a policy and identify what, what military equipment and publish that on our city website. That was done on March 13th. It's currently on our city website. And then moving forward, we're looking for approval from the governing body, which is the, the city council, uh, and to establish that policy, um, having this public hearing, and then to, like I said, this, we'll submit an annual report. So, it, like I said, the, the definition of military equipment is in your packet. It's kind of just summarized a little bit, but it really talks about drones, robots, <clears throat> armored vehicles. Um, a lot of uh, stuff that, quite honestly, the police department doesn't have. Um, so there's 15 different categories. Uh, like I said, they're all listed out in the packet. The current inventory of the fleet of capital police department, really the only thing that we have to disclose is our kinetic uh, energy weapons, which is the less lethal shotgun. Uh, we did, out of, out of just really the interest of transparency, uh, added our personal and department-owned rifles, but they're actually not required for AD 481. Um, we did <clears throat> have a section there talking about the, the use of allied agency uh, resources. And essentially, they have to be approved by their body and for, for them to be used within our jurisdiction. And then there's a reporting element that goes with that if that come back to council. Uh, like I said, the, the police department doesn't, <clears throat> uh, well, we don't, we don't participate in any of the uh, 1033 programs, which are the programs uh, that were designed where they were taking Department of Defense uh, military equipment and kind of reallocating that to local jurisdictions, but we don't participate in any of those programs. 
Like I said, in your the uh, attachments that you have with the proposed ordinance, our military use policy, and then the actual reading of the A D forty one. You know, so like I said, the policy is, is attached. I just kind of highlighted the, the stuff that's required that's in the policy, and then if you look to the right of each of the, of the uh, descriptions there, it actually has the policy that you can, you can look at specifically. But it basically covers the definition of what the military equipment is. Um, we have identified a military equipment coordinator and their responsibilities. Um, we've listed in that packet all of the current military equipment that we have, um, the, the approval requirements, the complaint process, uh, the annual reporting requirements, and the community, community engagement, which is part of the tonight's uh, presentation. <clears throat> so that annual reporting, what it, what it does is it basically covers use of the equipment, any complaints that are received. We'll have an internal audit process. Um, the cost of the, the any material that we're, any uh, equipment that we want to purchase for the next, for the coming year. Uh, that, that first report will be due by this next year, 2023. And then on the right of the of the um, PowerPoint here is just kind of the information that people can send any information or at, uh, to police chief at ci.capital.ca.us. You can call our non-emergency number and request to speak to the military equipment coordinator, or you can also send uh, something in via mail. Um, this is really uh, an important piece of, of this presentation, just talking about coordination with other jurisdictions. And essentially, uh, our policy would dictate that they, in order for us to uh, use or, or work with other jurisdictions, there, any of that equipment has to be approved by their body for us to, to use it. And like I said, then we would have a reporting come back to the council and let, let you know that we've actually used that type of equipment. And then uh, one of the things that we that we did notice um, in, in reviewing the packet that there is a correction to in the uh, recitals in the proposed ordinance, and that we need to and it's page uh, 92 in your packet on item one uh, D, and we just want to strike the word San Diego and insert Santa Cruz County. So we just want to kind of put that out there. And then tonight, the recommended action is to introduce the first reading by title only, waiving the full reading of, of the text, and then and ordinance adding section 2.60 for the capital media code, approving the military equipment use policy for police services, consider and consider adding section 2.60 of the capital media code, approving the military equipment use policy for police services. With that, I have, uh, I'm open for any questions that you have. Council member return. You're on mute, council member. Just yeah, there you go. Um, didn't push the space bar well enough. Yeah, yeah. I did have a question when you were talking about personal weapons, and you know, so I'm I'm going to ask that question. So you answered it in terms of transparency. So uh, thank you for doing that. Are there uh, other questions from council members to Chief Down? Uh, seeing none. Um, Chief Valley, I did have a question concerning the ordinance, um, and this is uh, subsection F on page 99 of the agenda packet. It, it states that the city council will review the ordinance annually and vote on whether to renew it at a regular meeting. Um, that, that struck me as a little inconsistent with um, the requirements of AB 481. Isn't this required? I mean, would the council have the ability to, at some later point, say we don't want this anymore? Because, Sam, is that something you're prepared to answer? Or? Sure. Um, likely not. You know, this is brand new legislation. And so every city across the state is complying with it, and it's possible there are some inconsistencies in it that would be worked out as we proceed. Um, the best I can do for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I'll let some future councils grapple with that with that question. Uh, and uh, yeah, but it seems like that if the council would have to deal with it, not to renew it. You know, maybe, maybe to amend it in some fashion, but that just kind of struck me as a little 
Um, but with that, are there any other um, questions? Seeing none, um, and again, I, on this item, I know there are no attendees. Uh, Larry, if you could just confirm there's, there's no emails or phone calls coming in. Mayor, sorry, we, we have not received any emails. Okay, I'll bring it back to the council then for further uh, deliberation and uh, a potential motion. I'm going to approve all of the recommended actions. Yes. Can I just point out, it looks like there's maybe a, a glitch in the recommended action. It looks like perhaps there was a, like something involving the uh, arrangement of the words. So I, the I'm trying to take out what it should be. It should be, thank you, <laughs> introduced for first reading by waiting title only. Or, I'm sorry, introduced for first reading by title only, waiting the full reading of the text of ordinance adding section 2.60 of the Capitol Municipal Code, approving a military use policy for police services. And that's the end. Yeah, okay. Thanks for that question. Um, so, um, Council Member Brown, just confirm that is your motion? That is my motion, thank you. Is there a second to that motion? I just had a quick question, Mayor Story. Do we need to include that amendment from Chief Daly regarding San Diego to Capitol Bluff? Sure. Yeah, yeah. If the city attorney feels the best, then. There you do. Yes. Or we can we can just correct it as a typo more than anything, but I appreciate a diligent motion. So um, it sounds like we'll be including in the motion with the correction articulated by Chief Dallas. Does that work, Council Member Brooks? Yeah, I'll go ahead and second. Okay. And there's a motion second, and it's been added to the motion that uh, the resolution is corrected to reflect the county of Sanctuary. Um, and, no, it's in, it's in reference because it says County of San Diego. It's talking about working collaboratively with other uh, federal agencies uh, within Santa Cruz County. Oh, my apologies. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, but then what they had there was within San Diego County, which that would be great to collaborate with San Diego County, but a bit of a reach. Um, so uh, with that, um, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Council Member Bertrand. I approve. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. And the motion passes unanimously. Um, and thank you, Captain Gary, for keeping us in compliance with uh, our state mandate. Um, and so with that, that brings us to uh, an adjournment. And therefore, I will adjourn this meeting um, to the next regular scheduled meeting of the Capitol City Council on April the 28th, starting at 7 p.m. And until that time, everyone be kind to yourself and be kind to each other. And we'll see you later. Everybody have a good evening. Bye-bye. Goodbye.